So we're now perfectly set up to come up with a single matrix that represents an arbitrary rotation in the three-dimensional space. Let's go over the three Euler steps. The first step is to get the twist right, and that's rotation with respect to the z-axis. The next step is to get the lean right, the latitude right, and that's rotation with respect to the y-axis by the angle theta. And the final step is to get the longitude right, and that's rotation once again with respect to the z-axis. So an arbitrary rotation, an arbitrary orientation of a rigid body can be constructed, can be represented by a matrix that's a product of three matrices representing these elementary rotations. And these matrices are right here. So, to construct this matrix, we need to multiply three matrices together. And as is always the case with matrices representing linear transformations that are stacked on top of each other, we must multiply them from right to left. The first operation is the rightmost matrix. The second operation is the next matrix to the left, and so forth. So the first matrix you must multiply by is rotation with respect to the z-axis by the angle psi. Let me make sure it fit. I just squeezed it in there. All right, so this is giving the object the proper twist. Then comes the proper lean from the z-axis, and that's rotation with respect to the matrix y by the angle theta. So now it's twisted properly, and leaned a proper amount from the z-axis, and finally comes swing it in, swinging it into place by once again rotating it with respect to the z-axis by the angle phi. And there you go, our goal has been accomplished. This is the matrix that represents an arbitrary rotation specified by the three Euler angles, and it is expressed as a product of three elementary rotations. So we have accomplished our goal. Now I will make, I think, three notes about this product. Note number one. If we multiply these three matrices together, then we will actually be able to see what the matrix R looks like explicitly. And it will be this matrix. And as you can see, it's a complete and total unhelpful mess. And that's the matrix that we would have obtained, of course, had we attempted constructing the matrix R all at once, presumably by applying this arbitrary rotation to every element of the basis, decomposing the images with respect to the basis itself, and then using the coefficients to populate the columns of R. So you can see that that would have been, at the very least, a very laborious process. Now, you might ask why multiply these matrices out? It's perfectly fine as it is, and you're right but it also depends on what you do. If you're performing some kind of theoretical analysis where you don't have the numerical values for these three angles, you just have these symbols, so you're working theoretically with symbols, then I would say, of course, you want to keep these matrices separate and just think of R as the product of these three very simple matrices. On the other hand, if you're working on an engineering project, for example, you have an object and you know its orientation in terms of the angles and you just have to plot it. So you have to multiply very many points, the points that represent your object, by the matrix R to put them in the right location many times because you have many products, excuse me, because you have many points. So you will have to evaluate the product with the matrix R very many times. And you have numerical values of these angles. So in that case, I think it would be much smarter to simply multiply these three matrices together because they don't have symbols in them. They're just nine numbers each, actually just five non-zero numbers each. And then you'll have a single matrix with as most nine entries in it. And then you would multiply all of your points by the single matrix. So of course it's much more efficient in terms of computer time. So depending on the situation, you may or may not want to multiply these matrices out. That's note number one. Note number two, do these matrices commute? And we have already seen that the matrices do not commute when we discussed whether the twist comes first or whether the twist comes last. And we realize that if we do give it the same twist 
according to the angle psi, then the results will be different. And of course, these two matrices don't commute either, either, because the way we have them right now, we give it the lean first and then swing it into place. Lean first, let me point the label towards you. Lean, okay, lean first, then swing it into place versus swing it into place, which would be simply a rotation around the z-axis. So there's no swinging, it's just twisting and then giving it the proper lean. Of course, you end up in a completely different location. We've seen it many times before. We're not at all surprised to see it once again now, but just keep in mind that in this product, nothing commutes. Just like in real life, your actions generally don't commute. These are very general sorts of actions, and there is no reason to expect anything here to commute, and in general, nothing here commutes. So it, they have to stay in this order. And finally, note number three. What are the properties of the matrix R? So let's review some of the properties of these elementary matrices that we have confirmed and studied in the two-dimensional case in the plane, but never explicitly stated in the three-dimensional case. So let's do it now. And I think they're completely straightforward, so we don't even have to write them down. Number one, the determinant of each one of these matrices is one. How do we know that? Well, we know that the determinant of this matrix is one, cosine squared plus sine squared. So with this one here, you just use the column expansion or row expansion property of the determinant, and you realize that the property of the whole thing is one times this determinant. So the determinant of this matrix is one, just like for any rotation matrix. Same thing here, except you would have to do an expansion on this column or this row, same thing. And of course, the same thing here. So the determinants of these matrices are all ones. What about the quote-unquote orthogonal property? Is, are the inverses of these matrices their transposes? And the answer is, of course, yes. There is a number of ways to see. Number one, you can multiply each one of these matrices by its transpose, and you'll see that you'll get the identity matrix. Or you can just make sure that its columns are orthonormal in the dot product sense with respect to the Cartesian basis. And of course, just because these guys are orthonormal, you will see that the overall columns are orthonormal as well. Uh, orth, that's right, orthonormal, which, which makes these matrices orthogonal. So all of these matrices are orthogonal. Okay, that's, those are the two primary properties of these rotation matrices. Now the interesting question is, does the matrix R satisfy the same two properties? And the answer is, you can pause the video and think about it, but the answer is absolutely yes. Here comes the determinant property. I'm just going to do it right in place. It will mess up this beautiful equation. Well, how about use a different color chalk, blue. Okay, and we'll just use the determinant property where that states that the determinant of a product is the product of determinants. So the determinant of R is right here. And here we have the determinant of the product, which of course is the product of determinants. There we go, not very pretty, not supposed to be. And each one of these is one, as we just discussed. So the determinant of this matrix is one. So despite this matrix being a ghastly mess. I quite agree. Its determinant is one. Now, is this matrix orthogonal? Are its columns orthonormal? That's actually a much more exciting question. It's just as easy to answer, and I will do it on the board when I erase here. But before I do that, I wanna point out that we know from other considerations that this matrix has gotta be orthogonal. Why? Because it represents a length-preserving transformation, no matter how complicated it is, this object is not changing its shape under rotations. And so being a matrix that represents a length-preserving linear transformation with respect to a Cartesian basis, it is necessarily an orthogonal matrix. So R transpose R equals the identity matrix. That's sort of a bird's eye argument, but I will give you a more explicit argument that utilizes the fact that 
each one of these matrices is orthogonal. So here it comes right after I erase the board. Okay, here we go. R is the product of these matrices. Let's take the inverse of both sides. And we could actually take the transpose of both sides and base our argument on that, but let's take the inverse. So R inverse is the inverse of this product. And as you know, the inverse of a product is the product of the inverses in the opposite order. So we'll have R sub Z of, whoops, this one can now, wait, no, I was right, right the first time. Psi used to be last, now comes first, and now R sub Y of theta inverse, and R sub Z of phi inverse. So now we have the, pro the product of these inverses in this particular order. Now we'll use the fact that each one of these matrices is orthogonal. So it's inverse, I'm going to do it right in place with a different color chalk. So the inverse is the transpose. Inverse is the transpose. Inverse is the transpose. And now we have the product of the transposes in this reverse order. And as you know, the product of the transposes is the transpose of the product in once again the reverse order. So this will be the transpose of this product. And now the order is restored. It's now once again the original order. R sub y of theta and finally R sub z of psi. So the order has been restored. So what, I have, what we have in parentheses right here is R itself. And we have R transpose, keeping this transpose. So the inverse of the matrix R is its transpose. So yes, indeed, the matrix R is orthogonal. Okay, so we have succeeded in constructing the matrix that represents an arbitrary rotation, <coughs> excuse me, with respect to a Cartesian basis. And in this video, we additionally determined two of its key properties.